Welcome everyone to PhD question mark by design. Uh, my name is Mark Morris. I'm head of teaching at the AA. Um, I've been invited um, to chair today's symposium by uh, the organizers of this event, Alif, Mohammed, Lucas, and Milad, who have uh, framed the discussion today loosely around a, a lack of consensus, they say, uh, within the school regarding what a PhD by design really means. Uh, they point to a convoluted understanding of its non-written components. So there's the hope today that somehow we maybe provide more definition in that direction. We'll see if that's so. Uh, the lack of consensus actually sounds like a positive or an opportunity, and it sounds rather AA. But perhaps this is not felt in the eyes of a new doctoral student wondering how to even begin their project, how to direct their research, and structure their work. So we need to put ourselves in their shoes. We might step back and ask whether the PhD by design constitutes a new type or rather a subtype. After all, the OU certificate one gets at the end of an AA PhD by design is identical to the PhD one. It might be a question of genres of study and research output. If the question really comes down to, quote, non-written components, unquote, we might remember that the PhD itself, even in, in its most traditional stance, can often include tables and figures. PhDs in art history, for example, include many figures, and writing to images, analyzing images, using images to illustrate conceptual points, has space and value in a normative PhD. PhDs in music and composition include sheet music, acoustic analysis, and even music tracks stored as digital files. These non-written components are essential in this scenario. Now, the history of the academic degree, going back to the 12th century, was organized originally across four faculties of the medieval university a basic faculty of arts, faculties of theology, medicine, and law. These last three were the higher degrees, faculty of arts, the basic degree. And as these grew out of monastic centers of learning, uh, the term master and doctor were largely interchangeable. Doctors tended to teach. That was their only differentiation. The PhD is a much later invention made distinct from the Master of Art at the University of Berlin in 1810. The arts faculty, which in Germany was referred to as the Faculty of Philosophy, started demanding contributions to research attested to by a dissertation for the award of their final degree to be called the Doctor of Philosophy. In the 19th century, both the US and UK universities started awarding PhDs directly following bachelor's degrees. There was no sort of middle zone of the masters. And these PhDs were largely taught rather than focused on research in the way that we think of research. The PhD requiring an honors or a master's in front of it only becomes the norm from 1917 onward. So it's only the PhD is only 100 years young, and it's still evolving. And today's symposium, I think, is part of that evolution. Now, the AA's PhD by design is described online and in the prospectus as, quote, studio-based PhDs in architectural design, unquote. And as part of the AA's admission policy, a PhD by design applicant may submit a portfolio alongside the normative elements required of any PhD program applicant. In that light, the implication is that the PhD by design, like the newish PhD in art, is a double whammy, where there's a written and design portion, each perhaps speaking to the other. We might interrogate today this notion of studio-based PhD. The most interesting qualification of the PhD by design put forward by the organizers of today's event is that the PhD by design engages with design discourse as both a contribution as well as a technique. That, to my mind, is a different take in contrast to studio-based, 
And we may find it still an emerging characteristic of this newish, it's about a six-year-old program now, genre of PhD. So this afternoon is organized as two parts. Firstly, we'll hear from the invitees, the doctoral supervisors, for up to 10 minutes apiece. They have been given the task of presenting a scenario of their own approach to PhD by design. Now, to gauge that level of different interpretation of format, the same topic on immigration was suggested by the organizers. However, some uh, will instead speak directly to their own association with PhD by design per se and how they view its contribution to the discipline, a more general conversation. Both approaches are valued. Secondly, after a brief tea break, we will reconvene here to have an open discussion on PhD by design, guided by questions from the audience and the rest of you as colleagues. The goal for today may not, in fact, be to better define this loose term, but possibly to acknowledge the usefulness of its looseness and challenge ourselves to experiment more radically with this type of scholarly work. I'm indebted to Brian Hatton, who uh, referred me to James Elkin's 14 Reasons to Mistrust a PhD. Elkin quotes Carol Becker uh, of Columbia University, previously dean of the Institute of Art. So I'll finish my intro with this quotation from Becker. And please, in your mind, as I, as I offer you this quote, uh, substitute the word artist for architect. This is Becker. The work that artists produce may cover all kinds of issues, globalization, identity politics, feminism, cultural criticism of all types, all issues of art history. There is no one discipline that the work actually addresses, as in chemistry, where there is a secure body of knowledge but constantly evolving. So to say that artists need their own type of doctorate doctorate, as if they need something which doesn't put the work into the context, in fact, that others might relate to, but rather secures a different type of degree just for them, where their type of production and its focus is the topic of study. I think that artists get excluded from existing doctorate programs because the field doesn't take their kind of production seriously as intellectual production. It makes much more sense and is far more subversive and respectful to bring artists into existing programs and force these programs to accept their work as work, as serious intellectual investigation and research that addresses a myriad of issues. So with that, I'd like to turn over to our table. As I say, I'm gonna keep everyone to about 10 minutes. And uh, we'll kick off with Paula Kadima from the Sustainable Environmental Design team. Paula. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Hello, everybody. Um, I think that those sitting there will have to turn their heads. Uh, I prepared a simple um, proposal for, for uh, today, designed specially for uh, this, um, uh, this symposium, and hopefully to contribute to the discussion on the topic. Uh, so this is a a fictitious proposal uh, entitled Enhancing the Dwelling Experience in High Dense Timber Buildings in London. Timber has been uh, claimed as being a very sustainable material and a good alternative to traditional construction materials such as um, concrete and steel. And um, um, timber is, is light, is a strong material, is easy to assemble, and, uh, um, and uh, in its most um, uh, modern engineered form, the cross-laminated timber, CLT, is also fire resistant. There are numerous examples uh, also in London which have been uh, using this material to build in height. And this is one of the examples. It's a tower in Hackney, the Murray Grove, uh, nine-story building, uh, nine-story uh, uh, block building, and it's fully built in CLT. 
Another example is a 10-story uh, development in Dalston, 121 units. And um, this development uh, is claimed to uh, use uh, one-fifth of the, uh, the material which would be used um, if it would be built in, in traditional materials. And also it is claimed to have uh, had 80% less deliveries on site to be built. This is a more audacious vision. Uh, it's the skyscraper by PLP in collaboration with uh, the University of Cambridge. And it's uh, fully uh, in timber. So this is a bit of the background. And now I would like to uh, focus on the problem. Although uh, timber buildings are thermally very efficient, and they may use to help us uh, decrease our bills, bills uh, for, for heating uh, in the heating season. They may also cause a problem of overheating in the summer period. And the Grove, uh, the Grove, uh, Mary Grove building has been studied and can also demonstrate uh, this fact. Adding to this problem, there is another problem. With the housing crisis in London and the pressure to build high and dense buildings, the tendency is to the flats to become smaller and, um, and uh, the, the, the double loaded corridor access uh, is a typical way to compress and, and, and increase this density of residential buildings. So this will uh, decrease and, 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 in, in, and uh, contribute to, to the overheating problem. So these corridors usually are long, dark, stuffy. They are not naturally ventilated, and uh, they uh, contribute to the, to the um, bad quality experience of the inhabitants. We know, however, that the streets open to the sky from the brutalism can no longer solve the problems we face today. They are no longer sustainable, and so, what this uh, dissertation proposed to do, the aim, is to explore a variety of design solutions for timber residential blocks with alternative layouts and naturally ventilated access corridors in order to minimize the overheating potential of the dwellings while tackling London's need for high quality and high density housing that provides natural and healthy living environment. So the methodology which could be uh, followed by a sort of research like this would include, uh, at the beginning, like most of the theses, a critical review uh, of published literature, also including examples of built precedents. On a different stage, it could include some field work in London. So a few of uh, examples could be selected uh, and studied further, monitored, measured, feedback from, from uh, occupants. And uh, the result of this field work could be used to support both the departing statements, but also to validate the models which would be used to later inform the design development and to assess various schemes which would be elaborated. So a large part of this research would be carried out by design on the developing, exploring, and fine-tuning of the various proposed design solutions. While the analytic work with the use of specialized tools would, be model, would help to model and assess the environmental performance of selected design parameters informing the design development. In terms of outcomes, um, 
the, the, this, uh, this research could uh, provide um, could include drawings and other visualizations. It could also include videos. For instance, some of the testing, instead of using simulation tools, could be using uh, laboratory experiments, such as the wind tunnel, and could be carried out with a series of photographs or filming. And these filmings could also be included on, on, on the outcomes of this dissertation. It could also include 3D models and, of course, written and numerical values. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. I want to turn over to Maria Guedici, and uh, she'll be speaking from the city architecture stream. Thank you. Thank you to the organizers, actually, for having me here. As uh, Mark just said, actually, I represent uh, a program that is uh, headed by Pier Vittorio Aureli. So I would say that actually the presentation comes also from him. Um, similarly to Paula, uh, I also thought of bringing actually something from my own experience, uh, in fact, actually, to the symposium. So what I'm going to present now uh, is, in fact, uh, uh, current research uh, that I am carrying out uh, and uh, that we also discussed uh, in the series of, of, um, sorry, of seminars that we had with Per Vittorio in the fall semester. Uh, but I'm going to try to see actually how that could be formulated more uh, in the vein of a PhD thesis. Uh, I cannot invent material that doesn't exist, so I'm basing myself on actual uh, research that I'm carrying out right now. So the first point, I guess, uh, in uh, sorry, there's a mistake. The first point, I guess, in any research is actually to have an issue or a starting point. Then a question of positioning the issue uh, in the wider field. Uh, a question of actually finding examples uh, that can back up our hypothesis. Uh, and I think that actually this is common to many theses. Uh, but I guess that on top of that, what we are trying to do in the city architecture program and what I also do in my own work is also to back up that type of work, more a theoretical uh, type of research, uh, with uh, drawing-led research that I really see as a form of design that then can lead to a typological analysis and eventually uh, to the development of an alternative scenario. I would say not dissimilarly, actually, to the proposal that, uh, that Paula just presented. So first of all, the issue in this case. I think uh, there's an issue, actually, with domestic space that we, I think we have all realized by uh, struggling as designers and as citizens. Uh, and this issue, actually, uh, is, in a way, twofold. On the one hand, we have a problem with designing the city at large. We all know that, actually, urban design is a discipline in transition, if not in crisis. On the other hand, actually, uh, the domestic domain that we live, that we experience uh, as users, uh, is incre increasingly homogenous. Uh, uh, and in a way struggles actually to cater to more specific uses. We have a number of design uh, proposals, types of experimentation that try to stretch the limits of what an apartment is uh, today. Uh, but I think that strikingly, if we look at these uh, examples, uh, and here I have a particularly, I think, good example from a very interesting project by Sana um, of 2001, uh, we see that all these different types of apartments are only uh, different on the surface uh, from a formal point of view, but they all entail a handling uh, of um, a package of spaces that, that every single apartment uh, we design today as designers uh, has to comprise. The bedroom, the bathroom, the living room, the kitchen, and so on and so forth. So it's like we have a kind of flat pack that we can only deploy in different shapes, uh, but not really challenge actually from within. And I think that this uh, uh, is an issue because it reflects uh, actually a subjectivity that has been packaged uh, in this typology that is in fact actually very, very flexible. So I would say that to a model of housing uh, corresponds a model of citizen, ultimately. So I guess at the core of the city, of, of, the, um, of this kind of uh, uh, question would be, how can we imagine different way of being uh, uh, citizens, of being people, uh, ultimately, by challenging uh, the typology of the apartment uh, as we have been taught to design as designers? And this really comes from my experience as a commercial design, designer of housing. 
Of course, there's a question, I think, when we develop a thesis uh, uh, that is not uh, just, uh, uh, just a professional investigation, but is also an academic investigation, to position yourself into a field. And I think that, to me, uh, two texts particularly have been very important in positioning mm, myself in this inquiry. There have been uh, Counterplanning of the ki from the Kitchen, that is an important uh, um, text for a specific strand of feminist literature that challenges uh, gender roles from within the house, not challenging actually the problem of gender roles in the workplace, but really within the house. And on the other hand, a very famous book by Jacques Donzelot, The Policing of Families, uh, that really goes to show how the contemporary family, the modern family, is essentially a project. A project has, a, has been carried uh, forth also through architecture and uh, I would say through typological manipulation. Now, as you will see, this positioning it positions myself into a theoretical field, but not so much into an architectural field. And I think that there's a reason for that. That is that actually this type of radical critique to the modern apartment, I would say, really comes from a field that is uh, hardly ever architectural. That is actually a field of theory, especially social theory, uh, political theory, or feminist theory. So I think that there would be grounds here for a PhD by design in that actually uh, we as designers with a design knowledge uh, can come in and challenge the same uh, um, problems actually that these writers have done from a theoretical point of view, really from the point of view of architecture as a discipline of space ultimately, and of typology particularly that is my specific interest. And of course, to back that up, there's a question of actually uh, backing up this position through uh, a research that has to be rooted into examples. And we all know that actually this is one of the most difficult things actually when we construct a thesis, uh, going to find references that can really strengthen or even challenge actually our point of view, but let's say that they, they can bring us to new assumptions. And I think here that actually uh, the question of examples is for me twofold. Uh, in a way, on the one hand, there's, a, there's almost like a need to really challenge what a house is, uh, the, uh, uh, from the root of what European housing is, and then a more specific, uh, uh, specific uh, uh, critique uh, to modern housing. And the two things are, of course, in continuity, but they are not exactly the same. So I would say that on one hand, actually, uh, what I've tried to engage in the last uh, uh, years is actually a very long-term genealogy of the formation of the house uh, in the West. And I think if you see actually this diagram, there's a series uh, of uh, housing types uh, from, uh, um, from, pre from actually uh, ancient Greece, uh, more or less from the year 1000 to the year 500 uh, before the current era. You can see that actually there has been a progressive uh, um, uh, growth in complexity actually of the housing types, uh, which is exactly what I want to challenge. Why do we need specialized spaces? And it turns out that actually this dynamic of specialization of different uh, rooms within the house. It's actually a very, very long dynamic. It, it didn't start yesterday. It started probably uh, a few thousand years ago. So it means that actually a side of the research maybe has to go very, very far back in order to challenge categories. Uh, ultimately, it's a question of challenging categories that we've been taught as designers to adhere to in a very strict way. The second part of the research is maybe uh, more focused, uh, and it's focused on actually how we, as uh, modern uh, European designers, uh, have come up with this toolbox uh, that we now deploy pretty much in all our projects. No? And I think now I'm giving you just three examples to see how, from the Renaissance to the, eight, the 1800s, uh, we go into a progressively increasing systematization and, uh, um, and specialization, really, of rooms that tend to be very typologically undefined up to the 1500s, uh, uh, to then become, on the contrary, incredibly defined uh, in the 1800s, also due to technological advances, obviously, that uh, allow us to define certain rooms as kitchen, bathroom, and so on and so forth. So into looking at these examples, I think it's quite important for our research to try to be as rigorous as possible with the material, obviously, I guess. So my simple way to try to define the field of intervention is to try to uh, pick a set of examples uh, that have a certain kind of affinity. In this case, uh, <coughs> uh, it's all uh, books, uh, all architectural treatises uh, on housing. Uh, and that, uh, I think, I hope, would allow me actually to, uh, to make these examples uh, somehow comparable. I'm not going to go in depth into what they are, just to say that they go actually from uh, the 1550s, uh, Sebastiano Serio, that is actually the very first treatise on housing, through the 1600s, uh, Pierre Lemoué, that is actually the first commer commercially success uh, successful treatise on housing, through other editions actually of uh, handbooks uh, pretty much on how to build your own house, uh, that I think prove the point of how actually an increasing uh, uh, typological specialization of different rooms has also defined an increasing uh, differentiation of roles within the house, gender roles, but also class roles, uh, age roles, and so on and so forth. 
And of course, that happens through a kind of an analysis, basically, of these, uh, um, of these texts that set forward uh, actually an idea of what the house should be. So ideally, if I had to compact all of that into a thesis, I would say that the thesis would comprise of three main parts. A uh, first part that has to do more with a positioning, actually, of the idea, uh, a theoretical positioning uh, and a typological positioning, then a core part of backing up, actually, the hypothesis uh, through examples and through uh, quite accurate typological and social analysis, actually, of these examples, and then perhaps, actually, to use that analysis as a springboard to come up with a conjecture uh, for uh, for an actual architectural project that can challenge, in fact, actually those assumptions. So to enter the second part of the thesis, uh, I think actually that analysis through drawing is uh, particularly important because I think it does allow us to enter into a type of typological analysis uh, that is very, very close to the artifact, uh, to really speak about space, uh, about the proportion of space, about the way, the very way in which actually we design space. That's something that I share with Peritorium, with the people that actually work with us in the city architecture uh, program, in that we tend to, uh, to try to produce as much as possible drawings that are our own redrawings uh, of uh, the case studies we treat. So for instance, here, uh, I'm not going to talk about the examples, but there's like a kind of cross-section of uh, housing examples that have all been redrawn uh, in scale with a specific type of methodology to show actually uh, how this construction of uh, roles basically within this house has happened. And I think maybe actually the original scene or the, the first moment that this actually subdivision of the house happened is really in the Neolithic era, where we go from a round house that cannot be subdivided to a rectangular house that on the contrary can be subdivided and therefore can hint uh, at this uh, choreography of roles that I was uh, uh, discussing before. And I think actually in this type of inquiry, the fact of actually really sitting down and trying to redraw these examples is incredibly important for us. This is already a project uh, because in deciding what we represent or what we don't represent, uh, how we represent things, uh, how we classify actually the findings that we are drawing, uh, uh, there is already for us a project. It is a project uh, of uh, really understanding from within uh, the, the space, really, through the means that we have uh, as designers that are obviously text, but also drawing. So these are all drawings done on purpose. They are not taken from books. Uh, so it's all a matter of actually reinterpreting the, the, the findings that we have into our own language. And hopefully, uh, I guess that uh, the idea of actually getting in depth into this redrawing, kind of almost like owning this uh, uh, historical project as if they were our own, but in a critical way, should um, in theory, become a good springboard uh, to then propose some kind of alternative scenario. I think for me, an alternative scenario uh, would uh, uh, also entail uh, um, a critique of what we're doing right now as designers uh, in, in our century. That's something that, again, as I was saying before, uh, I know very well having worked in commercial offices uh, and having done this type of job. Here, uh, I think there's a proof of actually the, how limiting our job is uh, uh, today. You see that actually in this famous scheme by Alexander Klein, uh, the apartment grows, uh, but the ingredients that the apartment is formed of don't change. So all of these apartments have exactly the same spaces. They, they are just inflated uh, or, or shrunk, uh, depending on how many square meters uh, you have to sell, pretty much. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, looking for an answer to this kind of problem of the limitations that we have when we think about housing in this very, very uh, strict typological uh, straitjacket, I would say, a possible solution for me, and this is not my own project, so I'm going to use a project that already exists, would be, for instance, the experiment, type of experimentation that uh, Lacaton and Vassal carry, carry uh, um, on in France in the last uh, 20 years, I would say, where they really try to actually challenge this typological differentiation of the apartment uh, from within uh, by adding uh, uh, semi-exterior spaces that, that are not typologically defined. So they do it by adding greenhouses, uh, by adding balconies, uh, uh, by adding extensions to existing buildings. And I would say that, that this is for me really the, the, the core of what uh, uh, this experiment would be about. It would be about building a kind of consciousness about the way in which we have been scripted uh, as citizens uh, through the scripting of our own house. Uh, and then using that type of awareness uh, to think what could be a scenario that could ultimately, in fact, actually uh, subvert these roles uh, or open ourselves up uh, to a different way of reading the family, reading the apartment, but also reading our own uh, way of being designers. Um, and I think that actually uh, the type of, uh, um, uh, let's say, roadmap uh, that I try to show you now is something that is shared by a few of the people that are working with us today. Uh, and it basically goes from the formulation of a project problem to the understanding of that problem in a specific context uh, 
through, I think, the very genealogy of how we as designers have faced that problem in previous times, and then to a proposal on how we could potentially subvert it uh, into a future. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. Uh, I'd like to turn the table to Simos Yanis, who is uh, going to speak from a point of view of uh, sustainable environmental design and also from his role as chair of the PhD committee. this question of uh, the PhD by design directly and, um, and, and say straight away that I find the expression rather than liberating as perhaps some people felt it might have been perhaps 15 years ago, very limiting and I will try to show why and, um, <clears throat> and to show also that we do not really need it, that we have more freedom uh, without it. Um, I looked at some alternatives because the, the problem is not with the PhD. We know what the PhD is. The problem is not what design. We think we know what design is. The problem is with that small word, by. Uh, so I looked at alternatives. Um, you know, over the years, I've been in this business for a long time. In fact, I started supervising PhDs in the, 19, in the late 1970s. And many of the prospective applicants have come to ask the question, well, shall I do a PhD or go back to design? Mm. Um, and others are coming who did actually took, did actually take the PhD. <laughs> Of course, it's, it's always possible to do a PhD on design. Mm. It's a very legitimate PhD. Or why not in design, a very acceptable, which in fact can develop into a PhD with design. Mm -hmm. And so address PhD and design both. And needless to say, there is no problem from the outset to do a PhD with no design. <laughs> so then I wonder, what can be a PhD by design? So let's look at some possible difficulties of the notion. Is it getting a PhD for doing nothing but design, which is what I think literally the expression by design means? Well, surely not. Mm. So then if design is the D in the PhD, what happens to the PH in PhD? Um, so the question is there of how much PH for PhD, or fee if you wish. And then similarly, how much D for design in the PhD? I mean, th these were not necessarily questions that existed before. They were not problems. They are now problems. In fact, this, this kind of problem has existed with every single one of you or others who at some time or other either thought about doing a PhD by design or think they were doing it, or thought they were doing it. So what, oops, sorry. More questions than answers by using the term. In fact, it's straightforward to, 
to think and, and to see that all PhDs require good planning, and we might use the word design in many different ways. The, the scientists will design experiments, um, and there are analytical, computational operations, and so forth, all of which need design. And so hijacking the word design under by design is, 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 not, is no good, because then it somehow suggests that anything which is not by design is not designed. In fact, even here we have this confusion in admissions that one stream is considered by design or in architectural design and, and the other is in research. But isn't the one in design also research? And couldn't the one that's called in research also include design? <laughs> So then about text and non-text and the other material and so forth. But a PhD thesis, well, to the extent that it remains a PhD, a philosophy doctorate, does rest on words in terms of the thesis, the issues, um, the literature. And it has to end with words. It's a page or more of conclusions. So words are there. And maybe that's all. And I was thinking, as, as thinking about this, that how flexible the PhD, the philosophy doctorate, has been. It encompasses all possible disciplines. And yet, what we do when we do it is very specific, incredibly specialized. All of them are very specialized, yet the degree is just a doctor of philosophy. We all become doctors of philosophy. Well, we all become doctors. In fact, you might find yourself as a doctor being called on an airplane to look after somebody who's ill and say, well, if you book your ticket and use your title, doctor. I said, doctor, doctor Erdine. We have a patient. So we're all doctors. So then that philosophy doctorate is quite flexible in structure, in contents, and in the media used. Nobody stops you from using other media, either for research or as the end product. Now, coming to the crunch, which is then exactly how and how much design is to feature in a PhD. Well, that is open. And I think Mark alluded to this at the beginning. It's a good thing for it to be open. It's open to experimentation, so the <coughs> learning process, and it's open to critical review, so that eventually it can't escape. If something is loose, if something is not right, then eventually it will be found and corrected. Now, <clears throat> PhD in architectural design, Ten years ago, almost to the day, we started discussions with the Open University about the creation of a PhD, which we eventually called PhD in Architectural Design, that got started as a discussion, as a conversation, because of the so-called PhD by design. So the fact that the PhD by design was there and was being advertised by a number of friendly neighboring institutions uh, prompted us to start thinking about this as well, both in terms of a PhD by design, as it was called, and in other formulations. In fact, the term PhD by design has remained with us only because people come and look for it and immediately perhaps get confused, but you know, I, I tried to explain that. So formally, we went for a PhD in architectural design. This was the title agreed with the Open University and adopted by us on all formal AA documents. And, and that had a beginning which said that it was to enable candidates of architectural background to make productive and creative use of their design skills within the scholarly tradition of doctoral research. You know, leaving a lot of room. So that was 
our proposal, which I um, uh, had edited myself and which was submitted on the 6th July of 2008, was approved. And uh, from the beginning of the 2008-9 academic year, we were advertising PhD in architectural design, and people were perhaps hearing PhD by design. <clears throat> Now, I would also like to show this. This is taken from um, pages eight and nine of our PhD program guide of this academic year. I shouldn't have to read these uh, to most of you because you, you're members of the PhD program and have uh, hopefully read because this describes exactly the, the room of maneuver we we have within the thing that we call PhD in architectural design and which, if you wish, can continue to call PhD by design. One thing that we've achieved with this, it's <clears throat> the part of the sentence that's highlighted in bold, that it's a viable option under any of the thematic strands of the school's postgraduate <laughs> programs, including history and <coughs> theory. So th th this is the strongest possible admission of the notion of design as a tool of research and of outcome that can be used by people like us who have been trained in it. And this is one of our main skills, possibly for many of us, the main skill with writing coming very much behind. And one of the reasons, in fact, that we insisted in making sure that the kind of products of architectural design can be included is because we feel those of us who have suffered, you know, to have to learn the techniques of writing and of needing to read a lot of papers and so forth, that, well, if we do that, at least let's also be able to use skills that we think um, we have learned. The other is that the origins of this PhD in architectural design go really back. Paolo described the project, which in a way describes projects that we have had in, 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 in our program of sustainable environmental design since the 1980s. So for more than 30 years, we've been doing projects that could be taken to be in this category of PhD in architectural design. What is new for me is the broadening, the fact that it's more inclusive. <clears throat> so that's simply to underline the fact that we see it as tool for research as well as the object of research. And then we come to the submission. With the Open University, we had very lengthy discussions about submission. And um, what is really interesting is, be is the fact that within the university, since the PhD exists in many different, under many different disciplines, and they're quite open. There's no limitation. I mean, music sheets, if you're a musician, equations, if you're a mathematician. Similarly, there was the question of the size of the text. In a conventional PhD, we have a 100,000 words maximum. There is no minimum because you could be writing the equation for special relativity again or something as clever, and that might be all that is needed. So there is no minimum. Um, however, it's very important, and, and I think um, this could be useful to some of you preparing applications. It's, it's very important to redefine the maximum. No way a PhD in architectural design of 100,000 words, because then it means you've killed your architectural design. It didn't count. So the agreement which we have formally is that your text, sorry, your architectural design input, whether it is under the research or under the product, counts takes the place of words. And therefore, if you asked me, I would say the limit for a PhD in architectural design, if you have really put design in it, 
in these terms, the limit would be between 30 and 40,000. 40,000 would be the maximum, perhaps 30,000 would be unacceptable, which is about double what we have for the, the masters. So um, that's about this. We're running a bit over time. Yeah, and, and, and that's it, really. Oh, yes, there is the question. There is the, well, the design component is not predetermined. And I would very strongly suggest that it stays like this, that you are free as candidates and the supervisors to do so. And the, 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 the question of examiners came up, whether examiners are qualified. Well, examiners should be qualified in the sense that they should be qualified in architectural design and as, an, as examiners. And then, of course, they can examine it as, um, as um, not an issue. Um, the only the only thing that may need to be brought to the to the viva that is not in the thesis in the dissertation might be some physical model, some experiment that needs to be run and needs to be done live. Otherwise, everything else is like a traditional uh, PhD viva. And then um, just I repeat. Uh, because I think many people had the idea that PhD by design was a different um, degree and perhaps a different certificate. It is not. It is the same degree and, and the same certificate. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Seamus. I wanted to next uh, turn the floor over to Mark Cousins, who wanted to speak on uh, broad themes related to the question of PhD by design, uh, not necessarily from a perspective of, his, of history and theory. Uh, Mark, the table is yours. Okay, well, <clears throat> at one level, um, I'm perhaps not a very suitable person. And in any case, I think really what I would want to hear this afternoon is more people talking about like their experience. And the crucial question, I think, is their experience is whether themselves or with their supervisors or whether they have a sense that the AA is developing a sort of, I don't mean a model, certainly not a definition, but a kind of practice of what these things are. I mean, in a sense, my, my, I, I was originally skeptical. I thought, well, if you have PhDs by design, does that mean the others that we do should be called PhDs by accident? Um, uh, my, my problem listening to Maria and Paula is I kept thinking the problem with them is this doesn't feel to me like a substantial uh, distinction. It could be done under the rubric of the ordinary thesis. Uh, um, so what's being said where, you know, there's obviously no easy line, first of all. I mean, after all, the ordinary PhD is very open. I've actually just supervised one, which supposedly is coming to examination very soon, where there is no text, just the footnotes. Uh, so you can see, like, it's not only no design, no text either. Um, and if we can, let's say that went successfully, yes. you could pretty much say there's no end to what you could do under the four definitions. After all, the definitions of PhDs, and this would apply to both, is that they are original work. Now, it's very important to recognize that original started off, say, up to the end of the 60s, as putting something archival on the table. If you were a historian and you did a PhD, you went and did archival research. If you were a literary historian or critic, you would go and find a text to edit. You're, you know, you, it's a, an act of scholarship. That sort of changed after 68, and you suddenly found people in sociology departments doing a PhD on Walter Benjamin without even being able to speak German. Now, and so originality now become much more like, you know, it ought to be quite interesting or something, and it's not obvious that someone said it before. But, you know, th there's no great definitional definition. 
So, you know, they could, I think both those as prospective PhDs could easily have been done under the existing rubric. The justification for having this distinction would be if and when the students and staff who are supervising them sort of collectively produce a sort of AA type where they can kind of integrate the, the design, whatever. My skepticism, however, is, is still there because while I don't examine any theses in architectural design, I have always designed, uh, examined quite a lot in the fine arts. And I tell you, even now, after decades of this, you still need this sort of like extra half an hour with the other <coughs> external examiner where you sort of agree on an ad hoc basis, how are we going to approach this? You know, there's a text and there's a sort of artwork. You know, how do you get to it? I think the issue is less fearsome in architecture because, as Maria said, there is no reason why design can't be investigative. There's no reason why design can't be a critique. So many of the intellectual functions of a text can be equally made parallel through design. And I think that's very important. But again, it, it kind of, it minimizes the difference. It says the same function can be fulfilled by different modes of discourse. So that's kind of very important. I would have thought the kind of tactical issues or the strategic issues within the AA, within this group of teachers and students, are questions like, how is the design integrated in the text? Certainly in the art world, you get the text and then comes the rest. If you were doing that in the architectural ones, if physically they, the design was all one thing, and quite distinct from the text, you'd think that's strange. Why wouldn't the design be distributed through the text? I mean, I think there are all sorts of custom and practice questions, which the experience of the staff and students would lead them to say, actually, we think this is a very productive and slightly collective way of doing it. It's not, in that sense, about definitions at all. It's about do some teachers and some students wish to engage in a type of work in some sense yet to be invented? And I think upon that and upon your experience of what is happening hangs a judgment on the value of it. They can't be given like in abstract. Um, you know, after all, I mean, as someone who writes, writing is a form of design. The organization of writing is a form of design. I mean, uh, at that level, you know, many things can be said to be designed. It, it, so you, they're not these like two different worlds. And none of them are exempt, it seems to me, from the overall to my mind, practical definition of a PhD as one which, after a while, the student can reduce to being a problem. And the PhD is some sort of solution to that problem. <laughs> Within those terms, yes. It's not that the PhD by design is necessarily justice, justified. It's only justified by an emerging practice. And the emerging practice, you know, is dependent upon <clears throat> these issues. I think it's quite good to lay out for the examiners how you've done it and how you want. I, I've always thought it'd be a good idea if at the, the probation period, you know, the student makes a commitment to say, like, how they want the thing to be examined. And then sends a statement of what form it will be taken so that the, ex the examiners are under the constraint of examining it in the form that people want. 
so you don't get things like saying, I thought the text was quite interesting, but boy, the design was awful. You know, and then what are we going to do about that? That shouldn't arise, in my view. So I think there are still grounds for skepticism. I mean, it has yet to prove itself by custom and practice to be uh, a new useful instrument at the AA. But that's how it proves itself. It's, I don't think we're going to get anywhere arguing definitionally. But you know, you should all think, how does your design come into a thesis? Because in a sense, that's a novel question. You know, architects have habits of how they put them into files or a portfolio or whatever. But it can't be like that. Uh, and so the certainly questions in my mind would be raised if it was like text, then design. Why would you make this distinction? It doesn't seem to have any intellectual justification. Of the obvious message of it all, the underlining, is that there have to be principled intellectual reasons for doing something. Otherwise, I think people should get on and do what they want. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. In the spirit of getting on, uh, we're going to turn the table to Mike Weinstock, uh, who wanted to speak again on the more broader themes of the day, not necessarily an M-Tech perspective. I think he also wants us to get on. Mike. Uh, it is going to be slightly an m tech one, but um, I'm going to read a short excerpt from a longer paper about design and design research. And m -Tech's located in, shall we say, the scientific end of the spectrum of, of uh, what, what counts as design research. So design has long been regarded as a kind of craft, proceeding without necessity of or reflection upon theory. As knowledge is embodied in the <laughs> physical artifact of the building or the city, it's thought to be sufficient to study the objects themselves to learn how to design and make them. Innovation came about by errors and exigencies in the operation of copying that accumulated over generations. <coughs> Design research, we may say as an intellectual study, commences with the scientific uh, the text by Simon in 1968, The Sciences of the Artificial, of the artifice of making, but Sciences of the Artificial, which was um, a later publication of an earlier essay and speeches that he made about 1962. There's a little bit of dispute that some people attribute design research and design science phrasing to uh, Buckminster Fuller around the late 50s. But in terms of publication, this is the earliest and the most uh, systematic. Simon is not an architect, he a, was a cognitive psychologist and he revised and updated that text uh, throughout most of his life. And I think there were three or four editions published. The 1962 text, The Architecture of Complexity, Hierarchical Systems, is regarded as his kind of masterpiece of his life, and it's rewritten as chapter five in that. So and he has certain characteristics of it which are taken up. Um, I think in the UK scene, as a formal, the first formal course of design research was uh, by an engineer called Archer, who founded it at the Royal College of Art in the late 1960s. And they started to run a course in a PhD program uh, in design research. And he described it, borrowing very thoroughly uh, from Simon and from Fuller, a systematic inquiry whose goal is knowledge of, or in the embodiment of, the material configuration, composition, structure, purpose, value, and meaning in man-made things and systems. And in response to what Marx just said, that would of course include all texts, all, all novels, films, and so forth. Although specifically, as an engineer, he was referring to structures, but he also had that very kind of broader vision of what it could be. And uh, there's a number of papers since then that uh, add some commentary and a small amount of significance to Nigel Cross. Design, you know, I think the paper is Designerly Ways of Knowing, uh, Natural Intelligence and Design. 
And that goes to the point of establishing that there is potentially a new form of knowledge that can be obtainable through designing. And I think when Maria's point of drawing his approach to design, and I think that's common to the fundamental foundation of all written PhDs, it's about uh, new, making new knowledge. Um, the principles, which I will come to and comment on a little more at the end, across many disciplines, and we need to remember design research is far from unique, and architecture is almost the last professional discipline to adopt design research. That it's design is a unique class of inquiry that may include some combination from a larger set of principles. And those principles are the relation of form and behavior, integrated knowledge from the natural or cultural sciences, a specified degree of mutability, such as a relational model capable of adaptation to different circumstances or, or environments, testable propositions and principles of implementation, and an expository design. And that expository design can be conceptual, physical, or computational, and that it can be used for testing and evaluation. So I think I won't go through the rest of all of this, but this, the rest is a kind of unfolding and unpicking of, of, of the impact of those statements. I think in terms of the work in, in our research group, we're particularly wedded to um, the idea of the relation, relational model that has a specified degree of mutability. And I think this, in, in our world, bridges exactly um, the, the kind of fusion of um, ideation and new knowledge, but it is something that we can test and can be evaluated, and it resides within kind of, kind of cr critical acknowledgement of complexity sciences, the city, and the cultural uh, primation of uh, urban spaces. So th those are our particular aspects of it. But I think I'll leave it at that. Uh, before our coffee break, we have the last of the uh, presentations by our team, Marina Latouri, uh, speaking from a position of uh, history and critical thinking, but also uh, interested in the, uh, the question put by the organizers. Uh, she's taken it as the roadmap for her response. Thank you, the students, for um, taking the initiative and bringing all of us here. I think it's the first time that we all sit around the table and discuss. Even if we don't get to an answer, still it's very important to be here. And I would like, I mean, Mark talked about PhD, and I think what a PhD is, or how we do it, or how we approach it, uh, has been uh, uh, discussed by um, all of us, but I would like actually to focus for now and for the sake of our um, discussion on the second term, design, which we seem to all take it as a self-evident term, and we all know what that means because we are coming, most of us, from an architectural background or we from the point of view of a designer. And I would like to interrogate the term, uh, also coming from a more history and critical thinking perspective. I think I, uh, I always um, start from the naming and what uh, the name means, or what the, and actually what the name does not mean or does exclude. Um, so when we say, PhD by design, I'll start with the title that the students gave, which is PhD by design with a question mark. 
Uh, I'll leave the question mark for now. Uh, I think uh, um, Simos dealt with a preposition by, and as I said, we dealt with PhD. Uh, so I will uh, start with uh, the, the design. When, uh, so what my question is, what we categorize under the term design? Uh, it's the investigation of certain phases of the process. Is the material outcome? Is is the social function of the material outcome? Is design a very specific technical knowledge, or design, as it was also raised, especially with uh, Maria and um, Paula, it's a means primarily a means of investigation and inquiry of material special configurations, but also of conceptual configurations. Um, so I start, and I would, I start by saying, and uh, by returning to what Mark said, that actually writing it may also be designed, or may be seen or considered and treated as a design, or I would say as project. And in this sense, this also a way of, that demonstrates also a way of approaching uh, the process of the PhD, but also to approach uh, history and to approach language, for, which for me are also be, could be considered as projects. And here I use more the term project rather than design. And I would, for now, I would just emphasize that by also uh, having recourse to uh, one of the historians we discuss quite often with my students, Manfredo Tafuri, who wrote in his text, The Historical Project, that history is a project. And uh, in, on all senses of the term. And the, elsewhere, he wrote that history is an analytical construction that is never, def, never definite and is always provisional. So coming from that perspective or point of view, I would add that the history of language, like a history of a discipline, the history of technology or technologies or practices, it's not one of straightforward replacement of one meaning by another meaning, of one practice by another practice, or another technology by another technology, but it's a process of accumulation. And accumulation of new meanings, new reflections, of reflections which not necessarily displace the, uh, the other one. So we have, we have to deal and we have to encounter and engage with that historical process. And as I said, in this process, it's not so much to trace the meaning of a word, and I would agree again with Mark that it's not about defining terms here, but it's about what the terms or to what the names we use may exclude. Um, this, so I go, I'll go all the way back to the beginning of of the term design or diseño, which uh, it was introduced in the uh, 15th and 16th century as diseño, which meant drawing, but also the process of creation, uh, in order to show that actually this is that term allowed artists, uh, historians, or architects to define uh, architecture as a distinct discipline as a distinct practice, as a, later on as a distinct profession. So in one way, design, it's a term which lies, it const constitutes the essence of what we do, of the, of the, of the discipline of architecture. So I, that's why I would like us to frame it more as a disciplinary question. And it's the meaning of design, it's complex, and it has had and it has been used in many different ways. So it has a, a complexity and a multiplicity. So design from, uh, as it was uh, first used by the um, art theorist or historian or artist, uh, Giorgio Vasari, in uh, um, his work on the lives so in, in the, uh, of, of most of painters, sculptors, and architects, which was published in 1568. Uh, 
signified or is used to signify a visual expression of the concept, uh, which, which one has in the intellect. And also, uh, in another part of his text, he's uh, uh, using design to mean or to signify the principle of all creative processes. And it's worth noting here that six years before his publication, uh, Vasari had set the first Academy of Art, the first formal Academy of Art in Florence in 1562. And it was there where design was introduced as a curriculum. In one way, as a way, uh, as what <coughs> meant, indicated the process of learning and training in order to, so the artists, the young artists were not longer to train or to learn through uh, their um, participation in the, through, by assisting the master artist or the master builder, but by participating in discussions and theories about the formation of the artifact, of the material artifact. So here we have a shift of emphasis from the material to the process of the production of the material artifact. And in one way here we have a distinction between an intellectual labor and the manual labor. So design was introduced exactly to establish that distinction between the concept, the idea, and the translation of the idea into the drawing rather than the, build, the actual building or the actual production of the material artifact. So this, I think, I think it's good to bear that in mind that design men, means exactly what we do. And also design was established within uh, the context of the academy, the context of the teaching of art or the teaching of architecture. So in one way, it's what allowed also architecture, architecture or art to be taught and not to be learned through experience. So in one way, it's uh, what, it's exactly the, as uh, uh, Simo said, it's our object of study, but it's also our tool. It's what we do, that's what we do as architects. It's our, our field, our practice, but it's also the way we, uh, what we learn. What we, uh, the, is the object of education. Um, that form, that way of understanding, and also documenting and communicating the production of the material artifact, whether this is a painting or a building or indeed a city, outlines a new form or different form of knowledge and also the interrelationship between the intellectual uh, labor and the conditions of production. So it's not, so an observation which would come as to me uh, after having said that is what is the the social also function of that process because design is a complex practice. It's what we do. It's situated within uh, primarily the academic framework. And it's part at the same time uh, of it's part of a complex social practice and it's in immediate relation with material uh, cultures and material technologies without meaning this. So we work with this, uh, but it's not the object to what we do, it's more to think and to uh, develop the method towards that. Um, in this sense, going back also to what Maria presented at the beginning, I want also to say, uh, I would like also to open the question of what are the social uh, kind of qualities or principles or ideas we are aiming at with the design and with that process. So in, the, and in our context today, with uh, uh, the expanding informational economies, the new technologies of modes of production, the innovative material research, we often claim to propose alternative ways of understanding and designing cities, 
without always acknowledging that at the end, what we do is to amplify or alter or eliminate areas and forms of existing, existing forms of social experience. Mm. Um, and perhaps I would not go th through the rest of my notes, because I think it's more important to pass on to the discussion. But I would like to say that following on this, a PhD by design um, comes up with against a double difficulty, or if not a double aporia for me, that comes also from the possibility of uh, having PhD and design under one, one concept or one category. So for me, it would, not, it would not even be PhD in design, but I would say more PhD in architecture, mm. because design is something actually it the, constitutes the core of architecture as architecture is to be taught and to be practiced. And I'll stop here and I hope that more things will come. Thanks very much, Marina. All right. We are reconvening. In the uh, coffee interval, a question was already raised by a member of the audience about the requirement of uh, academic. Uh, do they need a PhD to teach? And it's a question of when do you get on the academic ladder, as it were. Um, indeed, plenty of professors of architecture currently teaching uh, do not have a PhD. But if you were to go out now and search for jobs in academia, at any university, any polytechnic, any school, uh, you would absolutely have to have a PhD to take on a junior lecturership. So this is a requirement entering academia. And this is relatively new. Apart from this school. Apart from the AA, which means to be apart from many things, uh, <laughs> by design. Uh, but I, I think it was an interesting question to raise. Are the people currently in uh, our PhD program all of a cohort imagining a life in the academy, or do they have other purposes to which they want to use their PhD? I'm sure that's the case. Uh, but it, it's an interesting question, at least to get certain balls rolling. But I wanted to open, uh, as I promised, uh, the table to any and all questions from the audience. We can come back to that one. Um, but we had many ideas put forward. And just to kind of rehearse, uh, as we were, were running along, uh, Paula talked about, for example, uh, the range of design work that might be uh, entertained within a PhD, including multimedia. Uh, and of course, she's the only one that truly abided by the organizer's uh, request and presented a mm -hmm. in utero uh, PhD by design proposal. Gold star. Uh, <laughs> Maria pointed to the fact, the premise, that you cannot even enter into uh, the scenario of the PhD without having an issue and without taking a position. And I think this is really key. Um, how you take a position, uh, how you draw on uh, examples that not only, she said, to, to justify your stance, but to challenge your stance, so you to work through examples that are counter to your premise. Uh, that was a really uh, fascinating angle. Uh, I think uh, Simos, uh, with his prepositions, opens up all the problematics of nomenclature. And having been part of some of the write-up of these uh, genres of PhD accepted with the OU, and the OU might be another kind of discussion we have today, um, he sets about how do we look at this um, rather cynically? How do we look at how it's been framed and how this institution has adopted a model that may or may not suit it? at the present time. Uh, Mark talked about uh, the PhD uh, as contributing some idea of original work or an act of scholarship. What would that be? How would that act uh, be uh, described? How does it enter into the text? 
Um, he also talked about custom and practice, um, that some of what we do, not only as, as PhD researchers, but as examiners, is by custom and practice. So it would be interesting to interrogate the habits, whether they be good or bad habits, surrounding the PhD. Uh, Mike entered into this world of design research. Um, architecture, he said, almost the last discipline to adopt design research as a serious endeavor. Irony, irony. Um, but also, I think, drew on scientific methods to say they're not so scientific in the end. They could be applied to anything, including questions in the humanities. Uh, I think Marina uh, ended by opening up that interrogation of the word design, uh, but also allowing the intellectual versus the manual labor, if you will, or the writing as a <coughs> chore versus the writing as a sort of intellectual practice or in fact a joy. After all, why would you go into some three, four, or five year turmoil if not for some bat whisper of joy? So there's that. Um, so that's where, that's where we've landed. So I thought for uh, the rest of the symposium, we should be open to your questions, but follow along or rehearse some of these themes raised in the first part. So uh, I'll open the floor. Could I, could I just yes, make, please. I just wanted to make a footnote about the sort of history of the PhD. Up until the 60s, uh, very few people who graduated ever wanted to do a PhD. It was because it was scholarly, and it was actually probably, in terms of their career, because they didn't want to be a teacher. That is to say, they lived in universities on fellowships and scholarships, which enabled them, you know, pretty much for their lifetime to do scholarly work in the archives. So we've seen, you know, a, a sea change since the 60s, in what a PhD is, and this terrible way in which it's rapidly becoming the currency for like, you know, tenure track job. And that in itself is kind of absolutely lamentable. Um, especially it spread, there was a whole kind of decade when it spread to Australia. It now goes like a sort of plague through China. Uh, and it's an incredibly ill-adjusted instrument if what you were trying to do was to breed a teacher. Mm. It's, it's, a, it's neither fish nor fowl. You know, it's a long piece of writing. Uh, the standards of a PhD aren't particularly high. Um, you know more, kind of, pretty much. You very rarely fail them. Um, they usually come, yes, you've passed, with a minor punishment attached. Uh, you know, do this and send it back in four months' time. Uh, it's the situation we inherit in which we have to live with. I mean, there's no, there's no outside of that. But no one should get too idealistic about the nature of a PhD nor a sense that PhDs are in some sense. I mean, I belong to a generation which wouldn't have dreamt to do one. I did sort of one, but I can't bear being in archives. I mean, apart from anything else, it ruins your cuffs. Uh, you know, it's all dusty and ugh, horrible. It's so hard to follow that, but there we are. Yeah. <laughs> We've never, never worked in our kind. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, uh, Brian, uh, you maybe you want to kick us off. Well, could, could I start with a very final remark that Marina uh, made about architecture? Is this on? Yes. Um, Although the word does uh, have provenance back to Alberti at least, uh, I know Adrian Forty makes the word design one of those words that he uh, links indelibly with the modern movement. Uh, that if, if somebody starts talking about design almost invariably, they are uh, somehow operative, as it were, w w within or from the modern movement in architecture. And this, in turn, seems to me to suggest a certain uh, inclination towards a kind of attempt to scientize uh, architecture. And this scientism is a bit of a problem here because 
there remains a certain je ne sais quoi about the creative work of architecture, which allies it to art rather than to science or to technology. And the uh, serious theoretical study of design that Mike uh, began to describe, um, I remember coming across this when I was looking through the staff list at Lancaster University. They seem to have a whole faculty of people up there doing this kind of thing. It's OK, um, but design isn't always architecture. And the trouble is that the word design can be used for purely technical uh, uh, operations, such as the design of instruments, which has neither architectural nor creative in the expressive uh, sense. Um, uh, connections uh, associated therewith. So that is one question is why don't we just call it PhD by architecture? Okay, uh, I'd like to respond. Yeah, may I? Mr. Chair. Um, I think design is a unique form of inquiry. I do think it can be both scholarly and patently, it, it, it's, as Mark would call it, the practice of the world. Everything we have on the table, this microphone, all of these things are, are products of design. It's an, a peculiar artifact of the small industry of uh, West, early Western architectural theory up until about the 1980s that is aligned only with art and is, a, is something similar to art. And I think there are other cultures and other civilization, other societies in the world civilization that have never made a difference between art and science. Right? But, but then you move into, I mean, that well, has a, a kind of great rationality that, yeah. that everything there is designed, but you move into what I take to be the current Greg Lynn position Huh. that there is a field of design. Within that, there's no special reason for having schools of architecture. No, I'm not quite in the Greglian position. I, I, I'm principally objecting to the <coughs> scientism, that there's some kind of diminution or loss of value uh, by emphasizing design as a unique form of inquiry. I think there are things, for example, if we talk about um, you were talking about social values and pu social purposes of space. You know, they, one would say that they can be read in an open texture, they're embodied in evolved tissues. And it's perfectly possible to use scientific method, methods to catalog, uncover, and discover high cultural values. They, they're, not, they're not separate things. Scientists aren't you know, little gnomes, they're just people like us. They wear the same clothes, they, <laughs> they go to the same films, they, they sleep in the same kind of bed, you know. And they, they have dreams and aspirations and values that, as architects do, you know. So I, it, it's also a very peculiar thing that seems to have happened from 90s onwards. It's beginning to be seriously questioned from the 90s onwards, but that period you referred to from 1960 to 19. 90 is more or less when science disappears from every faculty of architecture across the world and from every graduate school. Prior to that, you couldn't become an architect or think about architect without understanding something of science. And even if your interest was purely textual, archival uh, writing, you, you would, have, would have had to have a knowledge of science. It was regarded as you know, a cultured person had some knowledge of science. But then if there's this, you know, large, scientifically informed at least, field of design, what then become the reasons for isolating architecture from the rest of design? But that, 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 that is our problem, isn't it? That the scientists, they, they have a clearer notion of 
research method and research areas. We are all over the place. We can we, we try to claim any and, and and then we have to educate ourselves in the particularity of that area, of that discipline, which in some cases makes us really very vulnerable. You know, who are you? You know, you can hear I have heard this said to me, who are you to be here? And and, and then you feel like Whatever the field was, then you have to be at least like them to start with, and then to find yourself within your own field, if you can still manage and, and, and fuse the door, whatever it is that you wanted to do. I, I would say and I think, you know, we're overloading the discussion. I would like to ask the organizers, you know, who, who raised the question, who um, mentioned that they, they felt that there is no clear definition or no uh, consensus about what is meant or what is expected. I mean, I, I would like them to, to say something on this so that we can respond on specifics. Um, well, maybe we could start by why we wanted to organize this event. So it, we kind of came up with this idea after one of the PhD uh, meetings last year, I think, and there, we had a debate uh, around the table back then. Um, I think actually Simos uh, brought it up. Um, it was about one of the PhD uh, thesis, I can't remember right now, but that's not the point. So it was about what is actually PhD by design, what does design mean? And then we started you know, also discussing, you know, PhD in itself is a form of design, just like some of you have mentioned. And so it was really for us about to, 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 to discuss what I think in a way what design means because I think it comes down to the, to the question of what is design when we ask what, what is PhD by design, right? And um, we, I think I can speak for all of us, we are not in search of a definitive answer but we thought it would be very intriguing to hear your opinions and uh, to, to see to start this kind of conversation, you know, among let's say different programs and different research interests, and to kind of carry it forward, maybe in the next term or next year as well, and to open it up to other schools of architecture, because we are also aware that, um, for example, other schools have different modes of PhD by design. So, not only it's 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 a, it's let's say a discussion within the AA, but it, this this discussion is also taking place outside the AA. So I think, and. And you know, obviously, thinking about the fact that it's a, sort of a new form of PhD, I think it's, it's great to start kind of talking about it and also opening up to the PhD students here and whoever is interested to sum up my point. I don't know if you guys want to say something. Yes, I think adding to this, uh, we essentially cross-referenced different PhD programs both in London and abroad, and we came across definitions and blurbs which mentioned um, terms like like practice-led, practice-based, studio-based. Mm -hmm. And there was an intrigue to really hear from the supervisors themselves how they define these terms and how we can um, relate to these. Because essentially also at the AA, uh, often you arrive and then there, you don't really see a studio because I think there has only been a studio since one year at the AA, or one and a half years, and uh, a situation we'd like to hear more on. Students, if uh, anyone has a question, we would be happy. Um, I have a sort of really pragmatic question, a bit in response to you, Mark, um, from the problem of people needing a PhD to get a job. Um, and is one of the issues of calling it PhD by design to do with your CV and being able to be published? And for the, a lot of architects might want to say, apply for an academic post, but they're not published in a peer reviewed journal because that's not how their sort of practice is normally published. So is it in part to do with that problematic of what's considered part of that as opposed to? If you found that more people who did PhD by design, we're getting tenure track jobs and one's doing an ordinary PhD. That's fine by me. Go ahead and do it. Uh, 
But I think really the, the question which comes up today is this, you know, it's been going for what, 10 years? Yes. The question is, is there by sort of informal processes or custom and practice, is there an emerging sense, probably most acutely amongst the students, but perhaps also amongst the supervisors, that there is, you know, you could tell that this is a PhD by design done at the AA. For example, you can read people's PhD. And if you go and read Colin Rose, PhD, you can see that he was supervised by Vic Gover. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, at that level, really, of detail, uh, is there a sort of emerging knowledge which would help you and indeed supervisors to know is happening? Do your informal, you know, do you tend to handle the distribution of design in the thesis in typical ways? You know, there are lots of decisions about PhD that aren't necessarily obvious. Has it had an effect? Can I, can I just try to clarify? Because I, I, I think PhD by design is a notion, is a ghost, is a ghost notion about which we speak, and it's okay to speak. It's not what we are doing. What we are doing is that individually, the students here have permission to incorporate the thing they call design within the context of their PhD in, in amounts which are negotiable. Now, if you wish to continue in your heads to call this PhD by design, do so. But whenever you interact with others or within your own mind, that expression, as I tried to show, can confuse you. That, that the PhD by design is a ghost. And, and for others also, I think I would state, is, it's a ghost. In, in the sense that, you know, it's, it's, they can do anything they please. And but usually, usually uh, when we say PhD by design, we always refer or we have in mind the final document. And PhD by design is a PhD which has a, what we call design component. That means that there is less text yeah. and there is some uh, visual or graphic material. But that's the, I mean, if, you, if one takes a set of drawings or images and tries to write a text through and around this visual material, it won't be considered PhD by design. So in one way, it's like graphic material which you produce, not you analyze. Because one could say that as an architect, you can also work through existing, you know, through the built, or through the graphic, or through the visual. And that's, in one way, the approach is the approach, the architectural approach, the viewpoint. Mm -hmm. So what differentiates this, which is again a PhD in architecture for a PhD by design, is that the PhD, the final document, has some graphic material or visual material, which is your own production. It has a project of your own. So, but that's where my question is. It, it's, it's no small point, because yeah. the next chapter of your life, having concluded your PhD successfully, is to turn it into a book. Mm -hmm. Whether you're tenure track or just uh, vain, you want the damn book. Uh, and so suddenly, the PhD by design, original work, material that Maria showed, for example, is suddenly, uh, the best thing a publisher has ever seen as a proposal, because the copyright issues around most PhDs that write to images, found images, die a slow death on the altar of there's no way to afford the publication around that PhD. The PhD is permissive. You can use copies of the Mona Lisa until your hand hurts. But to turn around and publish it means you have to have copyright permission from the Louvre and pay the fee. And those fees add up. So there's something interesting about the PhD design on a very practical level mm -hmm. that forces out certain production that is yours, that is truly yours, and can move in different directions, including a book. Mm -hmm. So a PhD by design then becomes like 
An ordinary PhD with do-it-yourself pictures. Do-it-yourself pictures. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. Not exactly. Yeah, so, mm. yeah. having, having done a PhD by design, um, <laughs> or in architecture, actually, it's called PhD in architecture on a different school. Um, one of the biggest questions in actually qualifying your own work <coughs> and your own words, I think, for me, comes through meeting two types of knowledge. Uh, one which is thought and understood, which is usually seen in the text, and the other one which is you know, but um, you can't quite tell. And what, I mean, this is Polonoi, but in any case, I didn't quote him, but um, as a designer and architect, um, there are processes by which we work which you can't read. Um, for example, if you have ever tried to ride a bicycle at 10 and never did, you can't read a book to learn how to ride a bicycle. Um, or if you hurt your hand and you need to wrap it by a, a sort of bandage, how hard should you press? So there are sorts of certain sensitivities that come through experience of your own practice and your own tools. So in order to actually understand that other form of knowledge, which could be called tacit, um, that could meet your thought process, you also need to know your tools. <coughs> and that tool may or may not be a pencil or a film or a computer. And by knowing that tool, um, you would also know how to experiment with that tool. And I think we didn't really talk about experimentation much today. Uh, which also contributes aspect to original knowledge, which is one of the conditions of the PhD, in any case, be it an archive, mm. either an archive by text or drawings or uh, buildings or typologies or whatever, or be it an archive um, of your own uh, processes. Um, I also think that maybe defining the terms is not an issue here. It's more about what AA wishes to pursue in this. And there are <coughs> questions that are quite interesting to be unique, as this is a unique school that I also intended. And I would believe that actually quite a lot of PhD by design or by architecture or by whatever has happened at the time when I was studying. So. I don't know if that helps, but that, that's what, what I would contribute to the debate. Well, thanks very much. I'm Richard Wolfe, and I'm um, a member of the AA and a, a Part 3 alumni. Um, I also teach at Kingston and Oxford Brooks on the RIBA studio course and at the Building Crafts College, which is a vocational course. I think what's very, very interesting here is the notion of um, PhD by practice or by design turning into an autobiographical element. This, I, I'm, I'm observing this. Um, and I don't think there's any harm whatsoever in talking honestly this afternoon about other courses and other programs which are out there. Okay, so it's very, very interesting that Mark mentioned about this blizzard of PhDs that sort of swept to Australia. Well, a lot of them now, and a lot of those um, programs are now being, you know, imported at Westminster, the RM, uh, RMIT course, which is incredibly successful and which I've actually sat in on to, as it were, test drive whether or not it's of interest to me. But the, the critical thing about it, I think, is this notion of the work being not original work of scholarship, which places the historic aspect on it, but the notion of it becoming autobiographical. And then, as you quite rightly say, Mark, the notion of straight to press, mm. yeah, the monograph. Okay, and I've been, certainly in the last couple of years, to many book launches next door, through that wall, through about 14 inches of masonry. And what I've actually observed are many PhDs by practices turning into an autobiographical monograph of the authors. So the subtext, 
which is what you mentioned, the notion of PhD being a prerequisite, an obligatory uh, requirement for access to an academic career, which wasn't the case when I was studying in the 80s and when I was thinking of studying here. So that, I think, is the driver. That, I think, is the driver for this particular program. I'd like to offer a response to the lady over there and to you. I, I think there is a useful distinction to make between uh, PhD by practice with a capital P referring to the architectural profession and what Mark would and I would say is practice is to do with ways of doing things. So I think that we are pursuing a different mode of doctoral degree that's not a PhD for uh, recognizing innovative uh, research within a practice. I think that's quite a different discipline so, and, and a different topic. Um, I think the great promise of PhD by, in, for, whatever, design, put your own uh, preposition there, uh, is, is the openness. For example, most, a great deal of our work is not to do with images, but it's to do with code. Mm -hmm. And um, they have, all of them, published papers in peer-reviewed journals, three or four, long before it comes to the Viva. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that the promise of Object, making architecture visible or um, achievable through means other than text can include many great things. And, you know, it should be, it, the promise is it would be much, much wider. And it's not a simple division between an image and, and a piece of text. And the same thing that actually in many, I don't want to get too technical, but it, in, uh, too scientific, because it would upset Brian, but many codes are written with text. So, mm -hmm. you know, to be a code writer, you also have to be, you know, very clear uh, mm -hmm. uh, knowledge of language. Um, and I think that those boundaries are blurring. For my own views, my own research, and, and looking at how education has changed in my lifetime in the AA and across the world, is all the disciplinary boundaries not just professional ones, but between f separate categories of physics, of maths, of language, of, of genetics, are all blurring. I mean, I, I agree with much of what Mike says, and I think you know, we should agree with the rest of the discussion that, in a sense, definitions will get you nowhere. Mm. Um, I mean, it occurs to me, for example, you know, a good example of uh, a PhD by design would be a typical PhD done by an archaeologist in which there's like reconstruction. You know, it doesn't have to be right. I mean, uh, it's a proposition. It's a proposition. Um, and traditionally made through drawing. Archaeologists didn't bother about, you know, should it be by design? I mean, it's called a PhD. But, you know, that's a typical piece of research work which has to use design and drawing as its kind of, you know, outcome. Uh, but it would be kind of silly to my mind to start saying, oh, well, let's go and get these archaeologists. I mean, uh, it's not about definitions. The, the, as I say, I mean, I, I won't say it anymore. It seems to me the, the question, I mean, in a sense, the, the reason for dividing the PhD by research or the research in design is that there's a, a practical question at stake that you imagine there's a group of students who would typically concentrate quite a lot of work on design. They could variously weave it into their thesis. So it does or doesn't have a break. And there would emerge a kind of uh, a notion of sort of smart practice, which does it. The question is really, has that happened? If you're to assess whether it's been worthwhile and continues to be worthwhile. Are students helped 
by thinking there's, you know, a group of people doing this and supervisors doing it, and it collectively pools its experience on what's worked, sometimes on what hasn't worked. And that seems to me the test of it. Uh, which is why I think, in a sense, you know, it's, it's when a student says, actually, I wouldn't have thought of doing this, but my colleague said, why didn't you do that? I mean, students are, in normal PhDs, are always kind of like thinking of questions between the organization of the thesis and what they want to say, where it goes, how it, you know, how you structure it, how you articulate it. And that becomes then just a certain group of people who have certain common problems uh, which they share. That seems to be both enough of a reason for calling it something identifiable and, you know, for them to talk together and whatever. I mean, you know, it, but it's, it's not exclusive, it's not definitional, it's, it, it really follows a kind of unplanned kind of history. Uh, and you've either bred something in an institution which seems to be creative and it seems to be, on average, quite good at. And then people say, actually, it's a very good place to go and do, you know, PhD by design. I think beyond a certain point, the only interesting thing, really, is the experience of the students mm. who are meant to be doing it. And because I, I, I feel we, can, we, we are repeating ourselves, ourselves here, without moving forward. Um, and, and it would be nice if, if we had in the room both some people who are engaged with the process at the moment and others who have completed it. Mm. And, and if we don't have enough attendance then to organize something else where we can and, and, and review this experience over the last 10 years, it is 10 years. Mm -hmm. I have documents to show the, the discussions we had the reasons for failure of consensus, as, as, as you mentioned, which were very acceptable. And uh, Mark um, agreed with this, because why should we agree with the form, the contents, and so forth? But then what did we know also? And the only way in which we can know is by hearing from you. I know that Elif has finished the PhDs, we have her experiences, and, and, and the others, all, all four of you that I can see there, are doing a PhD in design. So maybe you can say something. Um, when I started uh, two, three years ago, we were just talking up in the bar, when, where did we hear by design then? And I'm sorry, I never really read the perspective so clearly. <laughs> so I should have been more clear. So I mean, just to kind of put you through our shoes, when we came in, I remember discussions started happening between me and other students. I don't know how it came about, but are you doing a PhD by design or are you doing a PhD by research? I don't know how that question came about, but suddenly it just started to circulate kind of like a like a disease around the studio. And then some people, or at least us, perhaps the ones by design said, well, we're also doing research, so let's call what they're doing by history and theory. So then that brought up the second kind of issue, which was, well, since we're doing research, that means we must provide a proposal of some sort. And if they're doing history and theory, then it's, it must be an analytical or an analysis of some historical uh, uh, circumstance in architecture. And it, I don't think I was right. <laughs> right. But when you start to see, and what was very useful is the, the research proposal presentations that we used to do after three months. And you start to see some mirroring of you know, those who are doing PhD by, or in architectural design um, seem to go towards the path or at least mimic or mirror a path of a, of, of a master's thesis that is a little bit more uh, thought through. 
um, while others, and even I remember sitting in some of the other research proposals and not really understanding what they were putting forward because it wasn't sitting within what I thought was design mm. per se. Mm. Um, but I think it's just my personal perspective and how I thought about mm. it. So that's, that's what, what I found most beneficial as a PhD student personally is the, the, the idea that I was able to communicate with other PhD colleagues who were under the same, as you said, program, under the same theme as mine. And that pushed my work significantly forward simply because I was you know, communicating with others who had a similar direction of what I was doing. Although it was very interesting to talk with other students with, from other kind of streams, that was what I felt, felt was, was most contributing to, to, to the thesis. So that's a current. Mm -hmm. Good, thank yes. you. <laughs> well, maybe your other call. <clears throat> Uh, I do remember from the, my times at the GST um, talking to the head of the thesis program at the time, this was master's thesis, and I remember him saying um, that actually in a, in a weird way, by design thesis are probably the most scientific thesis around because we don't have a canon of methodology unlike other disciplines like um, medicine or sociology. In sociology or anthropology, one does a survey or in economics, um, it's a different method that, is, that defines the canon, sort of. Um, so in, a, in an ironic way, design is actually the only time when you have to justify your own method uh, in, a, in a most scientific way, because one needs to argue because there is no established canon. And um, when I arrived to this program here, uh, I didn't really need to have a method statement in my proposal. It actually took a while, it took around one year to finish um, the preliminary proposal. I'm now in my second year. And initially, I didn't really have to put forth a methodology section because it was assumed that the method in design is design. But this seems odd to me because I think one needs to argue and justify what we're actually doing. And this is part of why we're here. <laughs> I would also add, like to add something about uh, my own experience. Um, I may be wrong, but my perspective toward the PhD, whatever, by design or design, non-design, <laughs> is that uh, I think that when, I, when it comes to my thesis and research, uh, one I find it different from other methods in PhD is that maybe others trying to read between lines and find bits and parts, connect them together, make sense of a whole like a bigger scheme. But like with my case, I have to produce something to make sense of something and the argument I'm putting forward. And uh, that, that was my like initial uh, kind of experience and like thought about like what is a different approaches toward PhD within AA, which we call it design and research. Yeah. Well, I, I could offer some experience maybe from the non by design side. It seemed, I mean, compared to the, the brief which mentioned discord or like a lack of agreement on the term, lack of consensus. I think the first session presented basically a consensus, okay. uh, which was best summarized by Marina, according to the kind of disciplinary character of architecture and design being a linchpin of that disciplinary character. I think the challenge for my own work within a research or history theory PhD is historicizing and theorizing about that discipline and about that institution. And then the question of design, the question of architecture becomes a question of ideology. And actually, it's a struggle within the history theory side to specify those boundaries again. So I would maybe put forward a defense of history and theory as a separate problem which can address architecture as an institution, according to, say, uh, critique of ideology or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then from that perspective, the difference between saying having drawings or having text, having all text, having some drawings, uh, there may not be a qualitative difference between the drawings and the text insofar as it's uh, in a disciplinary proposition or, uh, or a project in that sense. So actually, it's a more, it's a deeper kind of conceptual theoretical problem. I think, it's, I think you're making a really interesting point and uh, uh, to the expense of actually making again one of these fine you know, points about words. I think that there is a, a 
or that we can assume a difference between project and design. And I think depending on which word we use, for me, this definition PhD by project or by design is incredibly mm, irrelevant and stupid, <laughs> as Mark was saying before. Or on the contrary, can be actually quite, quite useful, as you're pointing out right now. Uh, I think both uh, types of work, and I did a PhD by thesis, uh, or let's say traditional PhD myself, uh, uh, both things are projects indeed, yeah, because you need, they need to have an architecture, they need to have a structure, they need to be leading somewhere, so I think on that uh, is something that Mark has explained very well uh, earlier, and I think we can all agree on that. Having done, though, a PhD, a written PhD, in a traditional university with very, very strict rules that, in fact, actually forced me to write at least 70,000 words in order, to, uh, you know, in order to ask to defend <laughs> my thesis, um, I, I would agree, actually, with what Mike says, that there is a fundamentally different uh, uh, attitude to the type of inquiry, when, or also to what you were saying, uh, if you do it by thesis or by, by uh, just written, written text, or whether you assume, actually, the standpoint of a designer. Uh, there is definitely a burden of proposition, of being propositional that you have actually when you work through design. There is a different sensibility, as you were saying, that definitely uh, I was not allowed to use in my uh, by thesis thesis. But of course, I gained another type of freedom that is actually what you are hinting at, that is a possibility to be maybe more critical from certain points of view. Mm -hmm. So what I mean is this. I think that uh, they are both, uh, uh, both versions are both uh, undoubtedly design, uh, sorry, undoubtedly a project, but I do think that the PhD by design can perhaps uh, mobilize a certain, a certain way of doing research that is slightly different from the thesis. So that doesn't detract from one or from the other, but it puts you in a very different position. I actually started out off my thesis, uh, uh, just to go into the autobiographical, uh, hoping that I would be able to go into a by design uh, pro final product, because I am myself trained as a very conventional designer, like I've done this for many years. And I was not that, that at ease, let's say, with writing for a long time. But also, I really uh, wished to engage with my topic that was the architecture of the street in a very propositional manner. I was kind of told by the university that this was not possible, that the thesis had to have certain academic, academic criteria of scholarly writing that had to have at least 70,000 words. I could do everything I wanted on top of that, but it wouldn't really be assessed uh, uh, by the commission, so it was uh, somehow not considered. Um, and, uh, and I shifted throughout, actually, the writing of my thesis. Uh, I, I realized, actually, that this thing that I could not do, as Marina was saying, sometimes the things that define us are the things that we cannot do, uh, I realized that, actually, left me freer from a different point of view, that actually that I didn't have to assume the standpoint that the architecture of the street meant actually designing a street, but it meant actually being extremely critical, in fact, actually ending with a completely negative outlook on that, that this is not possible for me anymore right now, today. So each of us has a different story, has a different standpoint. Uh, but I do think that actually a different attitude vis-a-vis -vis your thesis uh, can, even with the very same initial issue that we were mm, talking about before, actually lead to quite uh, different results and to, to a quite different uh, outlook. However, one of these two things, that is the thesis, uh, can be uh, approached even by somebody that just has an art historical background, while I do think that a by design uh, uh, thesis uh, can only be developed uh, if you do have the baggage of tools that comes with being a designer. Uh, even that you ever practice or not, I don't think it's that important, but let's say that you have been trained uh, in, in the culture of design, as both Marina and, and Mike actually were explaining, as something that is actually quite, uh, quite definite. I had to wear the hat of an art historian, actually, for my thesis. And it was interesting. It was you know, a form of estrangement for me, coming from, again, this very commercial, traditional background of being a designer. And it was an interesting exercise that ultimately changed my life. Uh, but I think I could have done an equally interesting thesis uh, uh, that would have been completely different using the baggage of tools that I had uh, in my training as a designer, the sensibility, the, cap the capacity of understanding certain things, but even really just the methodology of going through a specific uh, set of motions for your investigation that you would never do if you tackle a thesis from an art historical point of view. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. think that one or the other is better or worse. Uh, uh, they are just different experiences that we all have in different moments. Uh, mm -hmm. Definitely, the thing that I do regret is that is that, that choice was not left, left to my Myself, but it was imposed on me from a framework that was, in a way, uh, that, I, that I couldn't choose somehow. No? So I think that actually the freedom that we have here to position ourselves within one or the other is, uh, is an incredible, uh, um, incredible luck, actually, that yeah, I, <laughs> I didn't have the possibility to have There's a, a question for the audience, but in front of that, and we will take that question, uh, both of you also wanted to respond to the previous. 
just to, to follow on what Maria said about the positioning, because uh, it's not only to have the um, knowledge of the tools, but I think it's also how you engage with the tools. Yeah. Doesn't matter if it's a text or a, a drawing, but it's how or uh, they're both. They can be both um, treated and considered and thought from the point of view of the project. And it's how we engage in this sense. Um, you, can be, you can use design in a very conventional sense. And then, uh, for me, it would not make any sense. Or you can use text in a very conventional sense. Or you can use both of them in a very critical sense. Mm -hmm. And I think, for me, that's most important. I think we have, in this sense, and I, I, this is something we can all share. The, the idea of positioning and what we want in the end to pose as a question, mm. either through the text or through the design. Mm. Paula. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to tell a different story. Um, I'm, I'm now a, a PhD supervisor here, but I also did my PhD at the AA. Uh, Mid-90s, I applied. Simos was my supervisor. And at the time, I didn't need a PhD for nothing. I came from practice. I was practicing for 10 years. I probably did a PhD by accident. <laughs> so uh, Simus has proposed several words in between PhD and design, such as PhD or design, PhD on design, PhD and design. Probably I would add another one, PhD towards design. Mm. In a way, I wanted to uh, become more knowledgeable Knowledgeable on, on the fields of sustainable design. I looked everywhere where I could um, continue my postgraduate studies, and I came across to the program, the Environment and Energy Program at the AA, and I said, that's it, I want to, to, to apply and, and, and get specialized here. However, when I called up, I was a bit shocked with the fees. So I said, well, I have to find another way on how to achieve my aims. And this uh, was uh, through applying uh, to a grant. Well, when you apply to a grant, you need always to give, give something back. They wanted a book. I said, OK, then I'll, I'll, I'll do what I want, which is to get specialized in the field to contribute to my design or to my professional practice, and I I'll, I'll, will end up at the end. So the whole process was very exciting, very interesting. And when I finished, I decided that I would not only practice, but I managed to combine both. I was practicing and teaching. And I think that this was, um, this was important for the students because they, 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 they had this different view of someone who was currently in practice and someone who also had some scholarly um, experience. So this is a different story. No, by accident. Uh, question. Right. Um, so um, I've been following uh, the PhD program at the AA for a while now, uh, not having done a PhD at the AA myself, but very much experiencing up close. Um, I'm going to try to pick up on certain things that were discussed by, by Mark, by Maria, by the students here. Uh, and maybe it's more of a comments last question to the panel that I can pick your brains on. For me, design and in the way that I'm, uh, I'm involved in teaching at the AA and the different programs and uh, some of the lab is through teamwork. So for instance, Mark mentioned something about having this group of students coming together, exchanging ideas. Same to the current PhD students, being able to share the different knowledge that they are engaging their uh, research on. Would the AA be then uh, tapping into that strength that has always made the AA, going at the bar, meeting people, exchanging ideas, part of that direction maybe to have PhD by teamwork? Or would that ever be something possible in the sense that we move away from that um, sort of lonely aspect of the PhD candidate student struggling within themselves? That's just food for thought, perhaps. 
Maybe actually I can answer you from the point of view of our working group of the city architecture, which is actually a part of a collective that started as a PhD program in the Netherlands, that was actually where I studied. It was called the City as a Project, that is kind of going on with the second incarnation now <laughs> in, uh, uh, at the AA. And uh, in both versions, uh, uh, something along the lines of what you described really happened in the sense that actually having a series of regular seminars uh, and regular exchanges uh, did mean that although each of us had a very definite position with completely different thesis subject and completely different interests and background and so on and so forth, uh, there was a kind of sort of shared discourse uh, that in the end uh, very much actually shaped uh, the flavor, let's say, or the bias of the thesis, uh, uh, still keeping the, our, individual, uh, um, our individuality. I'm not sure if this can be, you know, forced uh, on people, but I think we can definitely uh, foster these opportunities actually for dialogue, and that's definitely why we conceive we conceive of ourselves as a program, no? Where of course there's a head, but the head is not alone. There are the second supervisors, Mark Campbell, myself, uh, Adrian Lahoud, Sam Jacobi, and so on and so forth. That are all kind of contributing to the to the discussion, and uh, and of course then obviously the candidates. That I think. Sorry if I make a, a small note also here. I think we should not call them students also, by the way, because I think by now they are basically developing their own individual uh, yeah, research. Exactly, exactly okay. the same happens with uh, MTech and sustainable environmental design. In, in, and in fact, to generalize, every single program at DAA that has a studio of some kind, yes. and including it, is, yes. is a place yeah. where teamwork it happens. Uh, it happens. Well, and, and in fact, where the training also, the preparation for the PhD happens, because one thing that I think we should pursue is a more economic way towards the PhD. And that can be achieved by people going through our master's programs, which train in the particular research methods of each program, and, and make it very, very easy to proceed from the MRC or the MSc towards the PhD. Because essentially, I mean, in our case, in SED, that, that it's just a progression that uses the same fundamental core knowledge and, and, and methods. Yeah. We, and we're tools. not troubled by having grants very much of the A, grant-funded grant research. But it's a normative model, for example, at Etihad, from Ansacola, for example, with the inner chain PhDs, where the kind of leader writes an overall theme and uh, individuals contribute within a certain kind of boundaries of the set. So, and the advantage they have, of course, is that they're fully funded. The disadvantage is they can't really change their mind in the middle of the second year and kind of <laughs> slope yeah. off outside the boundary and say, I've had an amazing discovery, I don't want to do that anymore. I'm going to do this. So I think that the question of individuality is in, outside of the A anyway, there's an exchange between fully funded and partially funded and complete freedom where you have to kind of scrabble and find the money yourself or, or join a collective group. Um, but I think that being an individual within a collective is, I hope, a very strong yeah. Uh, yeah. position to be in. Mark. I mean, just to return to the question of teamwork, I mean, it seems to me I wasn't quite sure what you meant by it. Uh, I guess there are research projects in the natural sciences in which more than one person can partake yeah. in a PhD. But then the forms of work are, in a sense, quite very, very constrained and clear. Yeah. Uh, it's, in a sense, it's more a kind of rational division of labor. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's applicable in any easy way outside. I'm all in favor of every possible form of cooperation, discussion, whatever. <laughs> but I'm, the word team just like gets up my, it should be reserved for organized sport. Uh, <laughs> And, you know, God forbid that the AA would start everyone saying, well, I'm a good team player. <laughs> I mean, we exist in order to, <laughs> to present the antithesis of a team. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, I mean, there are certain terms which are so soaked in sentimental authoritarianism, like community. Uh, when a number of people work together on a project, what do you call them then, if they're not a team? Colleagues. 
Okay. And I, I also, together with that, um, it's not some boy <coughs> terror of team sports, is it? But, um, <laughs> It's the word team seems to alarm you greatly. It certainly does, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> as you move from scientific method to the odd piece of wild psychoanalytic interpretation, uh, you're probably quite right. <laughs> um, and, uh, but the, the, the point is, you know, people need to discuss disagree i mean let's yes. let's remember exactly. that the center or the heart of somewhere that's trying to think is disagreement yeah i mean you know show me a team show me a disagreement that's oh we're a team you know no <laughs> and secondly the other thing i would defend is the idea of personal supervision mm. yeah if you put 11 of them together and do a supervision you know it's like oh i mean imagine it there is something important about an individual supervision. Uh, it's kind of irreplaceable mm. yeah. to really helping a student and the supervisor. I mean, you know, supervisors ought to have to write papers on what they've learned during the process of supervision. Uh, but, you know, you can't just, you can't reproduce it in a group without reducing it. Mm. Yeah. I think that's one of the... And as, as we have on council, someone who is like, you know, all this online education. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, I can see the point of ordering groceries from Waitrose by online, but, you know, getting a PhD online, I mean, no. There is a purpose in people being together and finding ways of agreeing sometimes, agreeing with people they didn't expect to, and above all, disagreeing. Yeah. A better word, at least in this building, would be association, which doesn't imply agreement. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I wanted in the last uh, five minutes, we promised the room back at quarter till, to, uh, it hasn't come up yet, although, uh, Maria, you, you mentioned assessment. Uh, that PhD by design doesn't really ask for, or does it, special examiners. A PhD is unique in that it actually has a defined climax, a viva. Uh, is there a moment where you have to take your examiners, your guests aside and explain, by the way, it's PhD by design? Or is it just examined as any PhD? Well, you, you want to make sure that the examiners will be fair. Mm. And, and, and therefore, because it's up to us to nominate examiners. So the, the supervisor of the students would nominate. And then the PhD committee hopefully will agree. Or if they don't agree, then others will be nominated. So then one would look at the following. First, that these people can examine the PhD. <clears throat> Hopefully they have done it before. In fact, jointly, because there are two examiners, they have to have done at least five previous examinations of PhDs. And then secondly, in the case of the by design, okay, you're forcing me to use the term. <laughs> they, 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 they should be able to account for the value of the design component. That, that will be crucial because, as I said before, we can reduce the number of words usefully accounting for the design contribution. And the examiner should be able to confirm that. So, but the responsibility rests with us as a school to select them Indeed. properly. But I mean, that applies also to the examiners of the undergraduate school and the master's program. But by the way, since I have the microphone, just to tell him that, Mark, between 50 and 70%, I would think, of the master's program's work is done in teams, in groups, if you wish, if, if you prefer that. And, and some master's program, including MTech and landscape urbanism, even do that at the dissertation level. Yes, we don't, we don't have any individual dissertations, unless they've gone mad. Um, so, um, you know. But what should we call them? We should call them colleagues. The individuals, we should call them colleagues. But well, what we should call the entity. OK, can I add one thing to that? We had the discussion about there being an individual within a collective endeavor. Most of us would kind of understand that's what a studio is. But that doesn't, people outside of this 
don't understand why we use studio led. It doesn't convey the sense of being an individual and striving within a general theme that you, the person next to you, your colleagues, are also doing the same thing and might be doing it in a very different way. So I think there is a problem in using that as a des description because we all seem to understand more or less what a studio is. We can have quarrels and be emotional or disagreements and we're still more or less heading towards the same thing. And um, the word studio does not convey that outside of architecture. They see it as kind of artistic uh, wafting about with a paintbrush and you know, sort of chemically structured uh, interesting cigarettes and, and is, does that mean that, that maybe the motive for the PhD as a way of continuing architectural study is that the only way of finding a studio is to go back to school because historically you joined an office and the office was supposed to be a studio. Yes, of course, modern, modern offices are not studios. No, no, no. I, I think that's probably... <coughs> An interest. I think that's an insight. And, um, pretty much, I think what we're talking about is what you might think of as a atelier tradition rather yeah. than mm -hmm. um, studio. Grad schools throughout the world call them studios, and they but in in the end, they're much more like kind of atelier. Um, where there are certain forms of practice that are evolved and maybe very different artifacts or ambitions about the outcomes. But there, there's a kind of collegiate approach. So the outcome, the aims can be quite different. The ways of doing things can be quite shared. And I think that's the atelier tradition, which is... Um, but then I can't see that we'd ever attract, attract any students at all if we said PhD by atelier. <laughs> and on that note, um, <laughs> I think, Brian, that was a beautiful point to raise at the very end. It's, it's about continuing something or coming back to something. Uh, I'd like to thank, uh, again, our organizers, uh, Leif Mohammed, Lucas Malad. You've started something. You're going to have to finish something. There will be a part two <laughs> and a part three. Uh, but I think you've started something today that might have exceeded its function as originally framed, but uh, hopefully useful to you and every PhD student at the AA. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you.